Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is June 16th, 2022, and I'm really happy to be here with Antonio Mondesire Cabrera, uh, the oldest son of uh, Elba Cabrera, uh, and also the nephew of uh, Evelina Antonetti and uh, Lillian Lopez, and um, really an extremely, um, extremely interesting uh, individual in his own right um, with a very rich history. Uh, so looking forward to, um, to hearing uh, Antonio share today. And so why don't we start off um, by talking a little bit about your family's history and background and how they ended up in the Bronx. And of course, since, uh, uh, since multiple of your family members have recorded an oral history, Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the details will be similar, but let's hear um, let's hear what you know about your family's history and background and what you care to share. Well, thank you, Steve. This is a great opportunity. Oral histories and telling our stories is vital to the human experience. In my family, I'll focus on my maternal side because the record has most of my maternal family. My um, grandmother, my maternal grandmother, Evangelina Cruz Antonetti, sure. Grandma Eva, moved her family, my mother and Aunt Lily and Titi, to Concord Avenue in the Bronx, in the Melrose section of the Bronx, uh -huh. from El Barrio Spanish Hall. Sure. Now, fast forward, my mother goes to the Palladium, one of the first dancers she goes to, she meets my father, uh -huh. dashing uh -huh. gentleman from El Barrio, Tony French, from Dominica, the island of Dominica. My father kind of acculturated as a New Yorican. Okay, sure. They met at the Palladium, dancing to Tito Puente, who was singing, um, oh God, como fue, como fue, Miguelito Valdez? No, 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 mm. it'll come to me. Okay, okay, sure. They get married. I come along based on the cycles of nature. <laughs> and they were living in my father's apartment his, my paternal grandparents on 129th Street, right off Park Avenue. Okay. They applied for NYCHA housing. Because sure. there's a young couple, 21 and 23. And they were accepted by three housing projects back then. Wow. Queensboro Houses, Stapleton Houses in Staten Island, and Gun Hill Houses in the Bronx. Okay. Staten Island was like another country. Forget about it. Yeah. Forget about it, Max. <laughs> Queensboro? Ugh. <laughs> That's right under the Queensboro Bridge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Bronx? Oh, it's only 20 to 25 minutes on the train. And there's, there's trees that grow up there. Yeah. It's like yeah. the suburbs. Yeah. It's still a working class area. Yeah. But wow, they took a trip. This We want that. Gun Hill Road and White Plains. Boom. They move up to a little tiny apartment, apartment 8A and 735 Magenta Street, 1956. Mm. And I'm a little, little guy. Yeah. One or two years old, one years old. That was introduction to the Bronx. And then from there, my formative years were between 56 and 69 in the Gun Hill housing projects on White Plains Road and Gun Hill. Actually, it was Magenta Street. On Magenta, okay. Which is one block south of Gun Hill Road, but the major intersection was Gun Hill Road and White Plains, uh -huh. which at the time was the last stop on the 3rd Avenue well. And for a lot of folks, that was moving on up. Yeah, yeah. Out of the quote-unquote ghettos or the slums or the, the... Tenements, right. It was still a working class area, but sure. there was trees. Sure. It was predominantly working class Southern Italians who owned the private homes around the projects, and the projects were very integrated. Uh, okay, Working okay. class uh, Ashkenazi Jewish Americans who all tend to be on the liberal side. Yeah, yeah. Children of activists and da 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 da, -da. Yeah. African Americans, Irish, Italian, and some Puerto Ricans. Okay. A so handful, though. I think we handful. knew everybody in those six buildings wow. who were Puerto Rican. What's interesting is ethnic pride was not an issue in the 50s and into the 60s until like 67. Mm. So everybody, there was an unspoken value of becoming acculturated. 
mm. assimilated, like my three sons, Donna Reed. So ethnicity was expressed on a Sunday meal when mom would make arroz con pollo, arroz sure. con habichuelo, sometimes frituras like oh, okay. uh, pastelillos. Oh, wow, okay. And the music, Latin music, kept us ethnically connected. Sure. But the predominant culture, the dominant culture for everyone was Americanizing. Okay. I so I had students in my... Uh, under my uh, PS41, Olinville Avenue. And that's where you went to elementary, huh? Yeah, you know, Robles became Robles. Oh, okay. Uh, Rodriguez became Rodriguez. <laughs> Martinez became Martinez. <laughs> and the few Puerto Rican students there, depending on pigment and orientation, either kind of was acculturating, like in my case, to the African-American matrix as sure. a light-skinned Negro. Sure, sure, sure. Or some were acculturating as an ethnic, like an Italian or Jewish. Okay, I see. See? So the blessing I had because of my family, I was chameleon-like. And ethnicity wasn't an issue in the early days. Yeah. So most, I was in a... Gifted classes, IGC, intellectually gifted children. Sure. In PS41, Olinville Avenue, Magenta Street. Most of my teachers were Ashkenazi Jewish American women. Mm. I loved them all. With the exception of my fourth and fifth grade teacher, Miss Marion Z Zingaro, Italian American okay. from 220th Street on White Plains Road. I had a crush on her. <laughs> okay. And she taught Italian. <laughs> So I make a monton, yeah. <laughs> and that saved my rear end in the streets yeah. every now and then. That'd yeah. be another story. The 60s was relatively innocent. Even the tumultuous 60s, they killed Kennedy, I heard. They killed Malcolm X. Yeah. It was an intense decade. Absolutely. But for my upbringing, for a lot of us, it was still kind of innocent. Sure. You didn't feel the hard edge of living a little further down south. Yeah. Down on Melrose or Morrisania or yeah. south of the, the uh, Cross Bronx Cross Expressway. Bronx Expressway, yeah, sure. Because our area wasn't considered ghetto. Yeah. It was work, clearly working class. Yeah. But wasn't... And the, the, the harder edges, you saw with some of the gang, the tough guys, the young guys looking for swag. and All right, but it wasn't that hard. Okay. Until... Martin Luther King was assassinated. Okay. And the Vietnam War, anti-Vietnam War sentiment. Sure. And interestingly enough, when James Brown came out with I'm Black and I'm Proud, yeah. that song, yeah. that kind of like created a wave amongst all ethnic groups. Sure. So you see on the train, I'm Black and I'm Proud, I'm Puerto Rican, Buttons. Okay. I'm Italian, I'm proud. I'm, I'm Irish and I'm proud. I'm yeah. Jewish and I'm proud. And, and the flag colors. And at the time I was going to junior high school, 113, Olinville Junior High School, 213th Street and, and Barnes Avenue. Yeah. And what happened after grammar school, uh, junior high school energy where people's hormone rates were increasing mm. and like... Uh, a society where there is no rites of passage for young men or women. Yeah. So it started getting a little dicey. Sure. Even in the SP class, a special progress. And then with all the things going on in society, people started to dividing up according to ethnic ident identity references. Sure. All right. And that's what I, I started to go through that. Yeah. All my Jewish friends from the grammar school, like, no, now I have to, like, this is a little identity thing going on. Yeah. And male testosterone, I didn't want to be considered a bookworm. Sure. So I had to toggle between keeping my grades up as an intellectually gifted person and having some street swag. <laughs> Because the guys in the projects and the guys are, you know, it's a, a, a smarty guy, huh? Yeah, Bookworm. Yeah, yeah. Hey, come beat his butt. So, without rites of passage in the Bronx, in that period, 
with all that's going on in society too, it was a very interesting process I was mm. going through. But you know what? Diti created the United Bronx Parents in 66. Sure. That helped me a lot because I felt very comfortable going, taking the train 20 minutes and being in a neighborhood that was a little rougher, a little poorer, but people looked like me. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, like, it was connecting to an ethnic, uh, ethnic identity that I have. What helped, too, was Aunt Lily taking me to Puerto Rico. Sure. And I was culturally, ethnically, and spiritually connecting to my maternal birth, my maternal lineage's birthplace. Absolutely. Which is not concrete and gray buildings. It's palm trees, uh-huh. a sense of family. Costilla, Doña Vicenta Cruz, mm. Antonetti de Godro, was our matriarch, my grandmother's eldest sister. Sure. She had a little house in a urbanization, like a suburban development in the Rio Piedras, the outskirts of Rio Piedras. Okay. So it wasn't really urban, it was more like a suburban track near the Guaynabo border. Okay. And that was our go to in Puerto Rico. How old were you when you first went back to Puerto Rico with Lillian? My there were three trips that two trips that I remember but there were three trips in my formative years. The first trip I don't remember. I was two years old. Aha, uh-huh, sure. But the second trip when I was four to five, I remember. Wow. And it was before kindergarten. And it marked me forever. And then the next trip I went with Aunt Lily in 1966. I was 11 years old. She stayed for a week. I stayed for the entire summer. Wow. And back then, I rode all over San Juan on the blue buses. I got to know Viejo San Juan, Old San Juan, all the different neighborhoods. I traveled by myself. And I, I developed a, a, a love for the birthplace of my maternal lineage. Sure. So coming back to New York in the Bronx, I had a, a little bit of an anchor. And when the ethnic identity f- reference factor started to come up with everybody, yeah. I resonated with Puerto Rico. Sure. And I always took offense internally. I'll be classified as a light-skinned Negro with the mainstream culture. Bronx yeah. House Day Camp, the counselors will write up reports on all their, all the um, participants in the day, day, day camp. Yeah. And I read one. And there's some guy, this, this gentleman was writing his social work paper for NYU and had me down as light-skinned Negro. Mm. All right, I'm not rejecting my African ancestry. I'm very proud of it. Sure. But all that culture, that's not reflected in light-skinned Negro. What about Puerto Rico? What about Dominica on my father's side? Sure. So I said, wait a minute. This culture, I'm not just a light-skinned and Negro's black in in Spanish and Portuguese. Yeah, yeah. What about culture? Uh Uh-huh. See? Yeah. So that cultural connection was very... Important to me. Now, I didn't speak Spanish because monolingual North America, I said it the other day, has an Anglophonic mm. chauvinism. Mm-hmm. Monolistic, m- monolingual, Anglophonic chauvinism. Absolutely. Kids in Europe rattle off four or five languages. It's a, it was a, a big thing to push for bilingual education. Yeah. Wait a minute. I know. Young people, you you have the capacity to learn different languages. It expands the neurons. You become more socially, uh, more social advantage, more economic advantage. You speak more languages. Sure. So I struggled because I was raised in those formative years monolingual. Yeah. What saved me was the music Mm. and this inner desire I gotta get my Spanish together. The Spanish I'm taking in the junior high school with some of the non Latinos are getting better marks than me it was like a little nudge. Yeah, yeah. Come on, what's up with you, man? Yeah, yeah. So I um I pushed the envelope. And because of the I'm very grateful to Aunt Lily and Titi. Alright. Aunt Lily brought me to connect to Puerto Rico viscerally. Mm. To the island, the Coquis, 
the palm trees traveling around in the public cars to the different towns. Yeah. The, the love for the beach, you know, eating different foods, you know, that were not American mainstream. And the, the, the appreciation for higher levels of culture, too. Not higher levels, but more refined. Sure. Hard work, blah, blah, blah. But it was Titi who, when she saw the phenomenon of New York kids just acculturating to the African American matrix, she said, okay, that's okay. However, our African heritage comes from another angle. Mm-hmm. We have indigenous heritage, Taino Arawak. So she facilitated education on that level. And some of us know Taino, what the hell is a Taino? I don't know, what is it? <laughs> That's our Indian heritage. Yeah, really? We're first, second, third cousins to the Oglala, Lakota, the Mohawk, uh, the Iroquois. Yes. Don't look at them. They look like first, second cousins. Yeah. And then our Afri- we have African ancestry. Be proud of it. The film, Neneng de la Ruta Mora, mm. about Luis Aldea. Sure. Aldea, they don't call it Aldea anymore, but back then, yes. When you see people clearly of Central and African descent. Yeah. Wow! They're, and they're playing traditional music, very much inspired by what we consider African flavor. Yeah, Titi made sure, and Italy made sure that film would be played over and over and over again. People wow. see it. So I'm grateful for reinforcing an identity reference, which is important. Well, people may say, ah, oh, identity politics, really. Hello, this is a country where you, your ethnic group hyphen American. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. And we see other cultures who lost connection with the mother country. Definitely. Okay, they may have acculturated, assimilated into this, into the "quote unquote" white mainstream, but they lost a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And they're monolingual, and along that monocultural, and I'll say it, uh, they get dumbed down. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, but if you don't know your fa- your family comes from these cult- cultures with richness. Yeah, you're just identifying this American thing. Yeah, from the 20th century. Now in the 21st, you're dumbing down. Uh Uh-huh. No roots. No roots. No history, nothing. (laughs) And every culture is connected to the land. Yeah. That's why we're having all these wars. It's all about real estate and land. Uh Uh-huh. So land that I can relate to, and my wife too, because she was born in Puerto Rico, is in PR. Yeah. Or the Caribbean. Yeah. I went to my father's islands. I like it here. Yeah. I went, we go to the Dominican Republic. Oh, this feels good. The earth, Mother Earth. Yeah. And the palm trees. And people have this more sense of family. Yeah. Right? New York is a rough place. Yeah. So Titi and Aunt Lily, as leaders, provided that sense of family. We need the sense of family. Sure. See? So that's. Kind of long for an introduction, isn't it? No, that's that's great. That's great. <laughs> it's the um, coffee. It's the coffee. So uh, yeah. So let's. Uh, but before we move on with yeah. with other aspects of your childhood, um, uh, what what all do you know about your paternal side of the family? Paternal side, I know quite a bit. My father was born in Dominica, and uh, the Dominica matrix very fascinating. It's Franco Anglo. African and Carib mm. or Kalinago. Sure. That's the indigenous name, not the pejorative name that the French gave. Yeah. The Kalinago. It's, uh, it's Carib. It's Kalinago. So that blend is my father's side. And my mother's side is the blend of Iberian, African, and Taino. Yeah. Do you know when both families? Are in the same room, they look like each other <laughs> until they open their mouths. Sure, sure. So that impressed me as coming up like, wow, this Caribbean mix is so rich, man. Yeah. So my father's side is Franco Anglo. You know, the Dominica was the Spanish, became a Spanish colony, then the French fought the Spaniards, and they 
they took over and overlaid their Franco culture. And then the Brits, being Machiavellian that they are, wrestled that property from the French. So you have this on the European side, a Franco Anglo milieu, mm -hmm. which is, you know, obviously sets the tone for the island, but you have a strong West African because of the enslavement, blah, blah, blah. Sure. But more importantly, in my feeling, 25% of the island is considered Carib. Mm -hmm. They have a res quote unquote a reservation of pure Carib. Wow. And my wife and I visited that the island of my father's birth about 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. And we went straight to the uh, Carib reservation. It's like our cousins. Yeah, yeah. And what impressed me so much, besides meeting my family, I found that had status on the island. Uh -huh. So why they left? Why they leave such a beautiful island? Well, the streets up north are paved with gold, and that's uh -huh. the story for so many. Yeah. But when we met the Kalinago people, pejorative called Karen, mm. we on the roadside. Beautiful, man. The greenery, the breadfruit, the coconut trees. They were making yucca bread. Okay. Cassava bread, man. Sure. And I, we stopped to get some, right? Yeah. So, of course, I asked some questions, and the, the, the woman said, this recipe is 5,000 years old. Wow. Our ancestors have been making this for 5,000 years, and there's two types of yucca, cassava, a sweet one, and then one that's not so sweet. Yeah. And she went on the history of yucca, cassava, blah, 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 blah. My father didn't have access to all that. When he came to the United States in 35, he was four years old, East Harlem. Yeah. And my, his parents were traumatized. Because mm. they, they came from like petty bourgeois situation in Dominica. But they, they ran into some processes, lost money, lost business. Sure. Came up here. And they didn't have a petty bourgeois status. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. right? My, my grandmother had to work as a domestic. Mm. And my grandfather had to work as a porter. Okay. They came from means and, and social status on the island. Yeah. Here, mm, mm Yeah. And it was a combination, not just race, but class. My grandmother could pass for Italian, Jewish. She was very light-skinned. My yeah. father's mother. Even if she had the Franco, Anglo, African, uh, Car Carib, Kalinago mix, yeah. but she could pass for uh, you know, South Asian, or Sicilian. Yeah. My grandfather had African features a little more pronounced. But uh, the, the hard Anglo-American racist uh, stratification was shocking to them. Mm. Where on the Puerto Rican side, there was a more of a... Because the culture, in my opinion, was stronger. In my opinion, stronger made people more resilient. Yeah. And on the Puerto Rican side, there was a strong resonance with the Cuban. Yeah. Cubans who came to East Harlem. And if the Puerto Ricans are Cuban, we're first cousins. And that connection... And the music. The music. For and sure. the food. For sure. And the Latino personality is a little more spicy, as you've noticed. <laughs> a little more <laughs> emotional <laughs> and passion. Uh, the Franco and the Anglo tone people down with yeah. that, that stick up the rear end. Yeah, 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 come on, get out of here with that. <laughs> Pero Latino, una casa latina. Ah. <laughs> so that made people a little more resilient. Sure. And you could circumvent all the racism and the classism and all that stuff because you have this sense of like, like I'm, I'm grounded a little more. Yeah. I'm grounded. Like, you know, wait a minute. So my father resonated with that. Yeah. And he, in my opinion, acculturated as a New York Rican. Sure. He didn't de deny his Dominican. Well, where's Dominic? Every Dominique, where's that? Dominicano? No, 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 Dominique. Eh. Oh, Tony French. Oh, tu eres Frenchy, man. Come on, Frenchy. Yeah. So all of his buddies, he's talking about Puerto Ricans of all shades. Black, black, beige, beige, brown, brown, so-called white. All of his buddies were New York Ricans. Okay, yeah. 
So in that milieu, he, that was his formative years. Sure. Dominica is a wonderful island. I like, like the indigenous name for Puerto Rico is Borinque, mm -hmm. land of the noble ones. The, the indigenous name for Dominica, I think, is White Tubuli, mm -hmm. land of the tall, noble, or tall, graceful woman. Mm -hmm. See, we're not taught to embrace our indigenous with names like that. Yeah. Puerto Rico means rich port. Who's it rich for? The Spanish <laughs> colonialists. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then all the other Europeans were trying to r rip us off. Yeah. They're still ripping us off. Uh -huh. That's another conversation. Absolutely. So my father, God bless him, man. Look, straight talk. For the record, my father was a Korean vet. Yeah. And he got married, what, two years after the Korean War. Wow. Look, this is very, I'm very passionate about this. They didn't have... Names like PTSD. Sure. For vets who came back from a war, they had to kill people. Yeah. yeah. And they were not. Where were the institutional supports, the religious supports to have these men who were spiritually and moral, morally injured yeah. integrate back into society? Yeah. No. You're a man. That's what men do. Chalk it up. They were gooks anyway. Yeah, gooks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why dehumanize people like that? Yeah. So he got married anyway. And look, he did the best he could. Yeah. Under those and other processes he went through that were very traumatic. Sure. He did the best he could. All right? Because quite frankly, his own father, my great grand my grandfather, had traumas where uh, my father's own father. Yeah. You can interpret it, right? Yeah, yeah. So within that context, my father did the best he could. See? Wow. Young couple, Gun Hill Projects, surrounded by other young couples who are trying. Look, there's, a, there's an idealism in American culture. And like, you resonate with people trying to move forward, yeah. upward, upwardly mobile, and education is very big, especially amongst the Jewish. And my, my both... Both families kind of emulated the Jewish model. Mm. And I like that. Education. Educación. Sure. Find out. Aunt Lily. My great-grandfather on the maternal side is Spanish Jew. Aha. Uh -huh. Sephardim. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, so no uh -huh. wonder we resonate with the Jewish culture. We have sure. it in our blood. Sure. It wasn't just after the Inquisition that they, Spain tried to rid the country of Jewish people. A lot of Jewish people and quote-unquote Moors sure. had to supplement their Jewishness or their Islamicness uh -huh. and convert to being Roman Catholic and become good Spaniard citizens <laughs> and be closet Jews and closet Muslims sure. for generations. So we have a DNA connection to the Jewish community and to the Muslim community. Okay, yeah. Muslim from North Africa and Middle East and South Asia and Africa. Sure. So I'll say, I'll say shalom and I'll say assalamu alaikum in a minute. Yeah. See? Yeah. See? Where's all that come from? Aunt Lily and Titi because they had a... And my father too. My mother too. We have a nature that allows us to relate to anybody. It's human beings. And we kind of like different cultures. Yeah. You know, well, let's try that food. It's different. Oh, let's try it. Listen, listen to that music. It's kind of different. Let's go. My father, God bless him. Let's go exploring. Everybody goes to Pelham Bay Park or Orchard Beach in the summer. Yeah. No. Let's go upstate to these state parks. Hmm. That's what he did. Wow. Anthony Wayne swimming pool up in Rockland County. Mohansic State Park when it first opened. Rockland State Park. Wow, we're going upstate. Rockland County and Westchester County at the top. And then he'd invite people from our milieu. And they were like, what? Go where? Yeah, let's get a caravan cars and load up and we go to picnic up there. Yeah. Back then it was all lily white. 
You saw these ethnic people coming up and we set up our little picnics and playing Latin music on the little, little tiny boom boxes or no, reel to reel, portable reel to reel. Oh, reel to reel, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Since we were low in numbers, we were exotic. Mm. So maybe 2% of the population looked like us and sounded like us. Sure. We were not a threat. Until later on when the percentages uh, started to topple, then it shifted. But my father, that was my father, man. Wow. Get in the car with a map, and we go places all over. So the Bronx upbringing, I'm blessed. My father had this sense of adventure. He was healing himself from all the trauma. My mom was with him because of their uh, good social skills. Oh, you're going to like this. For the record, folks. House parties. Mm. That little apartment in the projects on Saturday nights, how my parents fit in, what, 10, ten couples? Wow. Dancing to the music of the Palladium, which is universal. Yeah. And then to stay relevant with young people, the Latin boogaloo and the R&B sounds. Sure. So they can feel like they're still young. Yeah. Right? Wow. They're already in their 30s. But they would, you know, I would, I couldn't go to sleep. Who can go to sleep? I know. So I'd come out in my pajamas and hang out. <laughs> Eat up all the potato chips and the onion dip my mother would make. And then dance the boogaloo with, with my parents' friends. And they wow. loved it. Or, and Latin, the Latin boogaloo, sure. right? Socialization was at a high level. So you saw New Yorkers, Italians, Jewish Couples, young couples who loved my parents, they stayed young. They stayed vibrant. Yeah. You fit all those people in a little apartment. Wow. And the level of socialization was very high. You don't have that now. Yeah. So we had less materially, but we had more socially, psychologically. People worked harder. The environment was tougher. Dirtier. Sure. Uh... It was violent, but people got along, mm. and they didn't carry so much. Uh, you dissipate a lot of trauma when you could socialize and yeah. laugh a lot and dance. And um, we go visit Uncle Walter and Aunt Eileen, my my adopted Jewish uncle and aunt, who moved to Rockland County. Uh, were they in Gun Hill at first? No, they were in Bronxville. My father worked with Uncle Walter at Loral Electronics on Story Avenue. Mm. And uh, they lived, they went from the Bronx to Bronxville. Uh -huh. And then in the early 60s, real big, big social move, so socioeconomic move, they bought a house in Rockland County, Pomona. Wow. In an area that was just being developed in the woods. Wow. So... Uncle Walter said, come on up. And my parents said, yeah, let's go up there. I was exposed to it as a young kid. Wow. So from the projects to Rockland County, with our adopted Jewish uncle and aunt, who loved us unconditionally. So yeah, I had the urban experience, but I had this other, these other layers of experiences that helped me, help my parents a hell of a lot, man. Sure, sure. It helped a hell of a lot. Absolutely. You know? Ask some more questions and sure. it'll engender more sure. insight. Um, so, so why don't you talk a little bit more about um, the, the neighborhood itself, what you do for fun around the neighborhood, if there were areas that you ran into trouble, if you went into, <laughs> things along those lines. The area coming up in the 60s called Williamsbridge, Olinville was relatively a nice neighborhood. Yeah. It was urban, but not with a hard edge. Sure. It was working class, but not with a hard edge. And I grew up as, I think, a nice kid. I wasn't, the mischief I got into was kind of like normal mischief. It wasn't really ornery or evil. Yeah. Uh, I was big on exploration. So my bicycle, oh God. 
as I was telling you before, I was a little reckless. <laughs> I'm so blessed to still be alive as I take that bicycle. And I, I was a speed demon. Any hill <laughs> in the Bronx, I, I would identify and pedal down the hill. <laughs> And if there was a stop sign at the bottom of the hill, I said, eh, let me look both ways and go to it because I love the speed. Um, growing up in that area was relatively, relatively a pleasant experience. Yeah. Right? Bicycles, some of the guys in the projects running around the, the Magenta Park. The tough guys in the park back then were Italian Americans who had a, a gang called the Playboys. And they had the swag and all the macho swag. And they were the tough. If you were tough and smoked cool cigarettes and had the pack on your T-shirts and had that look like, I'll kick your butt. Yeah. That's as far as it went. Maybe some guys had a switchblade. Yeah. That's it. And occasionally you saw fights, but it wasn't brutal. Yeah. It was more, more um, uh, posturing than anything else. Sure. And the next level is African-American males who had the rep of being more violent, but we were not as violent <laughs> as the Italian-American guys. Sure. But sure. they had the swag. Yeah. Back then, that was the toughness in the, in the projects. Yeah. The tough guys smoked cool cigarettes and maybe had a pocket knife. Okay. No guns. And drugs, no. Yeah. You heard maybe pot, but like, pot? Whoa. Until 1968. Uh -huh. After Martin Luther King was assassinated, and I had to reflect on this, all of a sudden, it took me years to figure this out, heroin started becoming popular in the projects. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the tough guys who a lot of us looked up to were snorting this stuff. Wow. And it was cool to have this, yo man, wow, you know, the, the druggy talk. Yeah, yeah. What the hell is this? And I saw it in, that, in the South Bronx when Titi was forming her organization and had neighborhood youth corps activities. And I saw heroin. A lot of guys started experimenting with this heroin stuff. Ooh. I put it all together. It was all well planned. Mm -hmm. Heroin doesn't grow on the trees in the Bronx. It's, there's a, a, a the sophisticated chain distribution chain to get that stuff in the neighborhood. Absolutely. Okay? But um, for the most part, the Bronx upbringing was pretty, pretty easy going. Um, here's one experience you, you, you uh, I'll state for the record. What was helping me connect to the cultural identity reference was the drum. Uh -huh. Very principled. Because in 1956, my father was driving a cab, going to college at night. When he had to babysit me, and my mother was, I don't know where my mother was, doing something. Anyway, he put me in front of the hi-fi speakers, which was his pride and joy. Yeah. And he loved Mongo Santa Maria. Aha, uh -huh. sure, sure. Because sure. Mongo Santa Maria was playing the conga when he met my mom at... The Palladium, <laughs> Dance of Tito Puente. Wow. And the closest any, anyone could get to Africa was to Mongo Santa Maria. Here, an uh, Afro-Cuban man playing a conga drum. His album, Chants and Drums, is... Drums and Chants. Chants, I've said, is beautiful. And that was the closest one could get to Africa. And this was ancestral call that he had, that the whole family had. Yeah. So he put on that album and put me by the speaker. Forget about it. Uh -huh. I would like want to crawl into the speaker. Then you heard, I heard some of those songs jazzed up. Tito Puente and Machito would jazz them up and turn them into dance sure. tunes. Sure. It was just drums and chants. And that was an introduction to Africa for me. And it went right into my DNA and resurrected. It, it tuned me to the ancestral connection. Yeah. That was resurrected when I was about 11 years old. Because mm. after the formative years, two to three years old, then the dominant Americanization process took over. 
But when I started getting close to my teen years, 11 years old, um, something happened. The identity issue I talked about, right? James Brown came out with I'm Black, I'm Proud. Well, I'm not African American and my roots aren't from the South, but I got an African connection. How can I express that? Bing! All of a sudden, remember, Mongo Santa Maria, Afro-Cuban drums and chants. And at the time, a lot of New Yorican males would play congas in the street. Mm -hmm. You had conga jam sessions in the South Bronx and East yeah. Harlem, not in the North Bronx. Sure. So that, the drum called me and it helped in almost like a quasi-informal rites of passage. Because I could gain male swag rep by playing the drum mm -hmm. without having to turn into a, 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 a juvenile delinquent. Sure. The toughest guys respected when you sit down and play that drum. Oh, the guy, the toughest guy. Oh, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. And it was also helping me with my Spanish. Sure. It was connecting me to Cuba is a role, in my, my experience, is still a role model for Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Larger island, more intense cultural processes. It never went through the same colonial process as Puerto Rico. And, and a, a certain pride and dignity was not beaten out of them. Mm -hmm. The colonialism had beat a lot of our pride and sense of assuredness out of our yeah. culture. Yeah. So Cuba, even the music, our salsa, the foundation's Cuban. Yeah. Okay? So um, the Drums and Chants album came back to me, and the song, the devotional songs to the Orisha became part of my matrix. Sure. See? The Yoruba religion, which is the foundation of Santeria, and the... Uh, uh, other a African ethnic expressions, Congo and Abakwa, Calabar, yeah. Dahomey, the African Cuban culture, in a sense, had all of these flavors in it. Sure. So when it came to the drum, here's a little story. So, Titi had a a neighborhood youth call program in sixty six, sixty seven, something like that. I worked cleaning up vacant lots, dead rats and all that stuff, dirt. But I saved up my money. And I bought a conga drum that was in a pawn shop in Times Square. A brand new conga drum, but they sold them in a pawn shop. A Mexican drum for $50. That's when Times Square was like, whoa, Times Square. <laughs> Sure. You had sure. hookers walking up in the street with the hot pants, and you had all kinds of street guys. Uh -huh. It was like to go to Times Square, you had to walk the streets with a little swag. Yeah, yeah. And I had some swag, and I bought my first conga drum for fifty dollars, man. Wow. Got on the number two train with my conga drum. Like, yeah. Okay. So here I'm in the North Bronx. Conga drumming's like not part. Everybody's trying to be American up here. Yeah. So my father says, don't play that drum in the street. We don't want it to sound like downtown because they'll call the cops on us. You know, yeah. we're trying to look like we're a little a cut above. You know, it was a social, sure. socioeconomic dynamic when you had conga drums in the South Bronx sure. and East Harlem. Sure. Here, you know, the Jewish and the Italian, you hear that, they think, oh, there goes the neighborhood. Yeah. So my father was like, mm. I wanted to play my conga drum in a hot summer day. Yeah. Let me sneak to Rosewood, Rosewood Park, mm -hmm. Olinville Avenue, and uh, Rosewood, between White Plains Road and Bronx Boulevard. I think it was Rosedale, Rosewood. Anyway, I go there. Yeah. They play some, a couple of beats in the drum here. 1968, I think it was. 67. Who, that was the, the executioner's park. Uh, okay. It was a Germanic Irish gang, quasi bikers, 
quasi straight up rough looking guys. Okay, the whole outlaw vibe. Yeah, man. outlaw. I mean, real. They look at you like, ooh. Yeah. But I said, let me go in there. I'm not. Mm. But I have a little testosterone. I start playing. These guys come around me with that look. But then they kind of softened up. Hey, yes, Santana! <laughs> right? Because Santana started becoming part of mainstream and Woodstock. And, sure. you know, Santana played Soul Sacrifice. And you had all these white guys go crazy. Wow, play that Santana stuff, man! <laughs> oh, and he, it like touched the primal wow. male energy that these guys never thought they had. Yeah. And they looked at me like with love now. Play that shit, man. That's wow. Hey, you want a beer? I'm 12 years old, beer. And they come around with a six pack. You you smoke reefer. We got reefer. Anything you want. Wow. I'm not going to try the reefer, but a cold beer on a, on a hot day. Sure. <laughs> Play that Santana stuff, man. Dun, 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 dun. And I inside of me is like, whoa. If I can cut the macho uh, uh, pecking order with these guys because yeah. of the drum, yeah. it's a hell of a lesson here. Absolutely. And it taught me a lot. There's something about music and drum that cuts through all the isms. Sure. When I left that park, when are you coming back to play that Santana shit? <laughs> What's your name? Anthony? You're... Hey, Joe, come here. And he comes in here, you he's okay. He plays that Santana shit. Anytime you come in here, anybody bother you, we'll cut them up. You see, you see these knives? We cut people, but we like you. You play that Santana shit, man. Wow. wow. Any beer you want, you want reefer, we got all the reefer you want. So I walked back to the... I didn't tell my father, but what a lesson that was. Yeah. So you know, the drum is universal. And then, of course, when we moved to Co-op City, yeah. I learned the same thing. Because this time, Co-op City has another story. Yeah. You know Co-op City, right? Sure, absolutely. They opened it up in 69. Yeah. Three buildings occupied by human beings. Yeah. Everything else was sand. Mm -hmm. Landfill. Rats running around. Wow. Yeah, and they, the place was still under construction. No roads, no land lights, no streets. This is the urban utopia we we're all saving for. <laughs> and I was 14 years old. We move in and say, holy cow, this is... Wow. Now it was high adventure. We're pioneering. Yeah. Here's a building sticking out of sand. Uh-huh. No streets. Yeah. And they had a parking garage that was not open, but they turned the bottom floor into a makeshift, makesh, makeshift supermarket. Okay. <laughs> Co-op supermarket. Sure, sure. The MTA, Mapstoa Bus, Mapstoa, Manhattan and Bronx Surface Operating Authority. Buses, the BX-15, which is now the BX something else, 28. Yeah. There was no road. So the bus will come down Gunnar Road, come across, uh, what, what street is that? Into Bartow Avenue. Bartow Avenue, okay. Go underneath the New England. Yeah. And then traverse on a dirt road to what's now like um, uh, Corp City Boulevard. Okay, okay. On a dirt <laughs> road. Dirt, as in D-I-R-T. Let me shut this phone off. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I had it off. My wife is calling me. We'll talk to her later. I'm 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 in a zone. <laughs> See? So I watched them put the streets in. Wow. Munis I, the city of New York came in, they laid the the, the, the the subsurface. I said, aren't they gonna clean up all that crap first? No, they just put the concrete on all that crap. Wow. Cans and old car tires, all that stuff. And then they put the the curb uh, moldings. Yeah. And then they put the asphalt. So I <laughs> saw that whole process. I saw them build the whole educational park. Sure. From scratch. And all the other buildings, I, I watched them build the buildings. Wow. So this is the urban utopia we <laughs> moved to. 
So when it was all beginning to gel, I meet Rudy Cabo Levilla because my parents formed the Spanish American Club of Co-op City. Oh, with long four, that. That's interesting. Yeah, with yeah. former Palladium contemporaries, all New Yorkers who escaped uh, neighborhoods that were compromising, and this was the soci socioeconomic upgrade to sure. move to the utopia. Yeah, yeah. So three couples formed the Spanish American. They, I remember they it re, they, they 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 deliberated over the name. Yeah. And you know the bodegas were called Spanish American Grocery, so they sure. said they chose Spanish American. So the Spanish American Club of Co-op City had a we formed the team branch, mm. and I was part of the team branch. Wow. And uh, on the hot days, prior to rehearsing indoors, we formed a little group, and we brought the conga drums out uh -huh. in Co-op City. Wow. And there was enough vacant areas of buildings that didn't open yet, sure. where you sit on a log or something, and we play rumba. And I saw the, 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 a lot of the Jewish kids were resonating with the hippie vibe, mm -hmm. Woodstock and the whole nine. Sure. And they also loved Santana. Uh -huh. So they mill around us just jumping around, not dancing, not singing, just like <laughs> the drum. <laughs> and a few um, guys I, I hung out with, we loved the drum and we were playing rumba. In Co-op City, and occasionally you see a river rat running around, or <laughs> you know you smell swamp from the landfill that didn't cover all the swamp sure, water. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, our favorite area is now called Bay Plaza, mm -hmm. the big shopping mall. That was like a jungle, uh, wow. a sand swampy uh, mangrove. Yeah, I saw the same thing. This drum, this music is a universal. And, you know, so that, I cut my teeth on that area, helping me, it was more a quasi rites of passage. Yeah. It linked me to Latino Caribbean culture. Sure. Because along with the music comes culture. Absolutely. History. Absolutely. Um, spirituality, sure. which led me to, I'm a babalawa now. That's right, that's right. Right? Yeah. So the Yoruba expression of uh, African spirituality in Cuba is the Lukumi tradition. Sure. The pejorative is Santeria. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, that's a little history with Santeria. Santeria, that term, as I understand, originated in Spain, mm. where the country people in Spain who did not fully acculturate to the Roman Catholic culture of the urban areas. Sure. These folks who lived in a more rural area were very devoted to the saints. Absolutely. Because yeah, yeah. they had a visceral connection with the Mother Earth and with these iconic saints. Sure. So they showed their devotion by carving saints out of wood. Yeah. To me, that's beautiful. It is, yeah. But the Roman Catholic elite society because to be a priest you had to be in the elite mm -hmm. class by the way mm -hmm. they called the country people santeros mm -hmm. which was a pejorative sure sure so that name carried over to this to cuba when our african ancestors were to maintain their humanity yeah. under spanish colonialism a very oppressive legal system and post-slavery dynamics, which were very oppressive, they used the Roman Catholic icons, which were imposed upon them sure. to protect their spirituality. Yeah. They hid the Orisha behind the Roman Catholic icons. Mm -hmm. They had to form societies called cabildos, which were under the authoritarian eye of the Catholic Church mm -hmm. 
So make sure there's no slave rebellions being formulated of in the course. church base. You could meet in the church basements, but you have to take care of the saint of the church, uh -huh. the promenade, keep, keep the place clean, da 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 yeah, yeah. On the saint days, you have to do the procession. Da, da. Yeah. Our ancestors, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. And part of Cuban society, like in other Latino societies, you had actually ethnic diversity. Sure. So people from different regions in Spain form social clubs. Mm -hmm. The Gallego social club, the Catalan social club, the Masonic clubs. Da, 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 da. Yeah. So that setting up clubs, even Sephardim synagogue. Sure. Okay. So our African ancestors formed little organizations according to not only the saints, but West African and Central African ethnic identities. Mm -hmm. See? So that whole phenomena was called, in some respects, called Santeria. Because the dominant cultures, oh, los negros, they like the saints. Oh, yeah, that's Santeria yeah, 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 stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Not realizing that your population is maintaining humanity. Absolutely. And taking care of all the Roman Catholic Church processes. Come on. Yeah. That process worked its way into the mainstream culture. Sure. So whether you have identifiable African ancestry or not, everybody in Cuba knows about Obatalade, uh -huh. Oshun, Yamaya, Chango. Absolutely. It's part of the culture. It's part of the music. Sure. See? So I say all that because the drum and the music brought me to that level. I said, this is something more than just these drum rhythms. There's yeah. culture, there's history. And what is it about this music that makes people happy? Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that in Germany. I hung out with, I uh, went to an international uh, uh, festival for political song. I was invited to go. My drum brought me to Germany. Wow. And the most popular group there was who? The Cuban group. Manguare. When they played, you saw Germans who couldn't dance a lick, but they just jump, jump up and down <laughs> happy. <laughs> sure, sure. You put warm beer in them, they're like hugging everybody. <laughs> so what is it about music that cuts through all the isms and people just light up? Yeah. And I saw people, Vietnamese and uh, Russian Jews from Moscow yeah. and um, uh, Yemen and... and uh, Chile and Germany and Norway, people of all, when they, the Cubans would play La Musica Cubana, uh -huh. everybody just enjoy themselves. So in my mind, music is universal. Yeah. And Titi and Aunt Lily, through embracing education, education is a universal. When we start understanding other people's cultures, history, you get past all this stuff. Titi was very much influenced by Marco Antonio sure. uh, from, from, uh, and LaGuardia from East Harlem, sure. Italian-American men who had vision of a larger expanse. Absolutely. Hey? She loved Malcolm X, Don Pedro Albizu Campos. So, and of course, Aunt Lily exposed me to so much. So what I'm trying to say is, my formative years were very diverse, very rich, and allowed me, I'm very blessed, man. And I would like, I like to pass that on to people because we're living in very testy times now. Yeah. Very testy times. I told you about the story. I'm not going to repeat it for the record, but just coming up here. Mm -hmm. People so volatile. See? So what would Aunt Lily do? What did Titi do? Oh, yeah, let's have some coffee. Let's talk. Let's talk. How you doing? Social skills, yeah. face to face. Yeah. Titi fighting the South Bronx. When we understand the historical processes, real estate interest in the South Bronx, redlining, that's an uphill battle. So what Titi fought for from between 1966 till the day she passed on 84, how many years was that? 
Uh, 18 years? 18, yeah. Wow. I learned young. In a library in the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Studying in the graduate school at night. I had the blessing to work in the transportation uh, planning division of a planning and development department. And I'm in the library, in the World Trade Center number one. And I'm like looking around, I come across some books. Planning Commission, New York City, 1920, the 20s. Wow, this is interesting stuff thumbing through. What? Buildings are built with planned obsolescence. Whoa, let me sit down and read this. So the buildings in the South Bronx were built with a 50, 50 year service life? Yeah. Wait a minute. So all this burning down stuff is part of a larger plan? Yep. Because they've made money off the land from the rent rolls. Mm -hmm. They've moved people out of the teeming slums of the low recycles. They built the elevated lines and the subway lines into the Bronx to move several ethnic groups that are now moving into the mainstream because yeah. they've acculturated enough. And the newer ethnic groups that are classified as uh, other yeah. are now part of this matrix, which is called ghetto. I said, oh my God, man, this is all part of a larger plan and redlining. I know. You start to study about redlining, wait a minute. So I, I, that realization's come to me after years of reflection, mm -hmm. see? So I kind of went on, off into a tangent, but to come back, uh, my family blessed me so much both sides, with a sense of humanity. Yeah. And even as we're going through a rough time now, <laughs> with the visceral experience I had coming here, <laughs> you know, I have to sit back and say, you know, so many people are so traumatized from generation to generation to generation of trauma that they're very angry. Yeah. My family did not promote anger. See? There was anger there. Sure. There's enough trauma to pass around. But I have to say, because of strong spirituality and the foundational work that Dia did, Aunt Lily, Titi, there are ways to turn anger, which is really frustrated creativity, yeah. to turn that into something creative. See, without violence, without contention, see? And that's what we all need to learn now. It's rough now. But you know, people don't talk. They'd rather text each other. Yeah. You know what it is to sit in a restaurant? There's four <laughs> people around food on the table. Uh, top, and they're all looking at their phone. <laughs> and they're texting each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's talking to each other? Yeah. So, I hope I've covered some ground here. You could ask more questions if you have. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to uh, pause it for a second. Oh. All right, Baba Tony. So so why don't you talk a little bit more about um, about music growing up? You, you talked already about the drum and the call of the drum. Uh, what other, or what, what kinds of music widely were you listening to at the time? Well, very blessed that, you know, um, prior to the drum and Latin music being part of my DNA, the early to mid 60s, I was acculturating like everybody else. So the Beatles were my go to. Sure, sure. And the AM stations like WABC, WMCA played the pop tunes of the day, uh -huh. which were the Beatles, Motown, uh, the Monkeys, the Birds, uh, sure. mainstream. Sure, sure, sure. And part of the mainstream culture, I was resonating with that music. Sure. I was also exposed to jazz through my father, because in addition to Latin music, he liked jazz. And his side of the family, yeah. Uncle Eddie, the, the big thing was to have a basement in a, in a private home in Queens and have first-class hi-fi systems. Wow. And the jazz of the day, from Bop 
to Miles, Bebe Cannonball, Adderley, John Coltrane. I heard all of that. Wow. So I enjoyed it. See? And my father um, built his first uh, hi-fi system in the late 50s or mid-50s, 57, 58, from kits. Wow. That was like, to, to build that yourself, he was an electronic technician, so he built it himself. So between the Latin music of the day and, and Latin jazz, which is uh, instrumental mambos, sure. Tito Puente and Machito um, really excelled at. Cal Jada, Cal when Jada. Mon Mongo Santa Maria went to play with Cal Jada with Willie Bobo. Yeah, oh, forget yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I heard that music and it, was, it, 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 it set me for life. Now in the 60s, the popular music, like I said, the Beatles came out, and I became a Beatles fan because it was like part of the entire Matrix. Sure, sure. And for a couple of years, I had all the albums from Meet the Beatles to Rubber Soul, and they were starting uh -huh. to become more hippie-ish. Sure, sure. When the Beatles went to um, Sgt. Pepper, yeah. that's where I kind of stopped. And I started getting more into the Motown sound, or because that's when the ethnic identity thing started kicking in. Sure. And a lot of New Yorkers at the time were actually resonating more with an African American cultural acculturation process. Yeah, and I was part of that too. Yeah. Until, like I shared earlier, around '68, the Latin Boogaloo era brought me more into listening to Latin music, along with the other dynamics, the drum calling me. Yeah. And believe it or not, Anglo. Now, Jewish American DJs, Dick Ricardo Sugar and Symphony Sid had Latin shows. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. And they played great music. They, they edified the younger generation, which was into the Latin Boogaloo sound, yeah. experimental uh -huh. R&B flavor and Latin music and Afro-Cuban bass. And they were also playing the popular Latin Sounds of the day of which Eddie Palmieri and Ray Barreto were at the top of that uh, food chain. Absolutely. And they were iconic. Yeah. And for me, to this day, Eddie Palmieri is a cultural hero. Sure. So in terms of music, his style, which is very... Okay, the foundation's clearly Afro-Cuban. Afro-Puerto Rican. But he overlays with jazz, uh -huh. um, sentiments, classically trained, he studies, he's a genius. And he puts in a, a, a primal, <laughs> a primal energy yeah. that's like, I, I call it the New York growl, which he literally <laughs> does sure. when he plays. Absolutely. Is this, this we, we in New York have this like, it has to be expressed creatively or else it's anger. Yeah. Well, that primal thing rocks me to the core. Along with his incredible genius-like selection of dissonance. You could play harmonically but throw in some chords that are dissonant yeah. that actually work. Yeah. And his separation of playing one rhythmic structure with the, le with the left hand and then riffing melodically with the right hand, yeah. the separation's like uncanny. Yeah. They call him the rumbero of pi piano. Sure. Because he, at he, at he attacks the piano with a percussive rhythmic sense and melodic. Yeah. So to me, that's like transcendental. Absolutely. So Latin jazz to me, which is my music, it's like world music because it incorporates the best of European, West African, Iberian from southern Spain, all these other elements. And there's enough room to have a, a South Asian Indian tabla player sit in and uh -huh. he'll, they'll find a way to fit them in. They will, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or a, 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 a kora player from Mali. Sit him in, or the sitar player from Mumbai. Sure. Sit him in and he'll jam with us. We'll sure. figure it out. There's a universality in music, and music is coded. See, that's the thing that, that really needs to be articulated. What is it about, for example, 
I've seen Japanese. You play a salsa tune and the Japanese get up and start dancing. Mm -hmm. There's coding. There's a code, especially from Cuba, embellished by Puerto Rico and Colombia and Venezuela, this, this Latin music, and then the African drumming style of West Africa and, and Central Africa, along with Southern Spain, Northern African, Iberian flavor, which has its roots in North Africa. Yeah. They call it Canto Hondo. You know, where you hear the scales coming out of the Middle East, North Africa? Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, the minor scales touch the heart. Yeah. The major scales touch the intellect. Mm -hmm. So when you play some, some tracks and pieces in the minor scale with the right rhythm, man, the, everybody is moved. Yeah. Either to dance or reflect or whatever, whatever, whatever. It's coded. And we could solve so many world problems. The politicians can't get along, but the musicians can. Can we take some lessons from that? Yeah. See? So music, to this day right now, when I pray, I have to add melody, intonation, and rhythm to my prayers. Sure. So you could lock in. I'm not doing anything new. Have you ever been to a Jewish wedding? You saw like you hear the cantors. Yeah, yeah. Those guys got juice. Uh huh. Wow. And then of course, um, my wife and I used to go to Sixth Street before the South Asian population started growing. In the early '80s, we go to Sixth Street in the East Village. Mm -hmm. Between Second and First Avenue, you have all the. South Asian Indian restaurant. Sure. And we go in and sometimes they have a tabla player and a sitar player playing in the window. We go, let's go eat in there. <laughs> and you listen to the sitar. And they're not playing a structure that's Western, it's like canned, it's like ongoing, but there is a structure to it. Yeah, yeah. That's like, wow, our mood would change. And these guys are like blissed out, man. Yeah, what definitely. is it in this music that sends people to another space? Yeah. It's special. So every now and then, you know, we put on some Indian music, raga or sitar and tabla, and say, wow, this, this is coded also. Sure. Music is coded. And it opens one up to developing not just high levels of intellect, but sometimes I'll put on Bach yeah. or Mozart and let it play in the background. It's like, whoa, this is good, man. You know? Now, I'll juxtapose it. I'm going to put this on the record. So, uh, <laughs> some rap music. Listen, I have a thing with this trap music. Mm. Let me share you some, something with you. I've seen in the African-American side of the coin, when men would sing a cappella in a group, edifying women. I saw that as a little kid. Yeah. Woo, woo, woo. That woo, woo, right. woo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo, woo. I've been waiting for this moment. Yeah. What happened in 65 years? Yeah. Oh, so my conspiracy theory hat comes on. No, no. <clears throat> All right, go ahead. Well, you know, Steve, um, music is coded messaging. And in the African spirituality expressed by the Yoruba, um, Ifa, which is coded wisdom, knowledge, knowledge, wisdom, and comprehension, the other metaphorical definitions is words of the Almighty, uh -huh. words of Olodumare. Olodumare meaning the Almighty, the owner of the sacred vessel that contains the full spectrum of the rainbow. Sure. That's a mouthful for the Almighty, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> but what do words of the Almighty mean? It's frequency, it's sound, enunciation. Yeah. 
enunciation sonic frequencies that we perceive through our hearing. <clears throat> and then move to the next level. The, sound, the, the power of the spoken word. Every culture has the power of the spoken word. Sure. It could be an Aramaic, Sanskrit, Yoruba, Cantonese, Chinese, Hebrew, every language. Yeah. The power of the spoken word. So when you add melody, harmony, rhythm, the power of the spoken word, and then if we just push it a little bit, it's the power of the vowels. Mm, sure. Not sure. just the consonants that separate the vowels, it's the vowels. Sure. We're talking about coding that every culture has to actually uplift or downgrade the human experience. Yeah. And that's universal. And it never ceases to amaze me. I appreciate different types of music. There's a German harpist called Andreas Wollenheider. Hmm. The way he plays that harp, it's not just angelic, it's got soul and flavor. Yeah, yeah. And some of his tracks I just play over and over and over. Wow. What's the coding in this music that's making me feel good? Yeah. What's the coding in Eddie Palmieri's solos? Sure. And you hear him growling. But man, his, that flavor. Yeah. It's the intonation, the rhythm, the harmony, sometimes the straight up dissonance, mm -hmm. well placed in a rhythmic and melodic structure. It's a code. To this day, I enjoy, even though some of his politics I, I've learned to be disappointed at, Miles Davis, So What? The kind of blue album? Sure. That's classic. That that trumpet solo never gets never deteriorates. Yeah. What's in the coding? Some of John Coltrane's. Oh, absolutely. Then on the percussion side. Manny O'Kendall. Oh, sure. He plays a timbal or bongo with very simple chops. They're almost cliche. But man, the coding is like a cosmic Morse code that makes you feel good. Yeah. What language is he speaking? See, that's the other thing. When I, for my Ifa ordination in West Africa, for the celebratory day, there were um, specialized drummers called, uh, who, whose patron, de patron deity is Ayangalu, okay, a okay. female deity owner of the drum. And it's understood the drum is our primal language. Yeah. So they played the talking drum, uh, which he adjusted the tone and tension of the skins with his arm. Oh, okay, okay. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And imitates the human voice. Sure. And the consonants and the vowels. And you heard it. Say, oh, I almost understand what he's saying. And everybody in the group understood what he was saying on the drum. Yeah. And then there was, Baba Lao put me to the side, you know, he's praising you. And thank God he's praising you because he could put everybody into, make everybody sick if he said the wrong things on the drum. <laughs> so that's how powerful this is. Absolutely. Your ordination, he was praising you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So I came home and said, oh, so all the drum rhythms we hear on the religious side, the bata drums, bembe drums, but also on the secular side, yeah. rumba, bomba, batucada, sure. tra a trap set in, in R&B or jazz, that's coded messaging. Yeah. And you and I know, you and I know, you get a real rock steady drummer behind a, a kit of drums? Yeah. Whoa. Absolutely. Right? Tito Puente, a drum, a timbal solo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, could you play that again? Um, there's some classic solos. Timbale, bongo, and conga I could hear over and over for the last 60 years. I never get tired of it. Yeah, yeah. What's in the coding of music? 
Who's the um, Italian opera? He's blind. Andreas Bocelli. Oh, uh, uh, Bocelli. Bocelli. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes he hits some notes and some phrases. It's like, whoa, man. Yeah. It touches you. Yeah. Uh, I can go on and on. Music is coded. And the music to me that touches the heart has transcendental properties. Yeah. I'm of the opinion, I know I'm not the only one, we could do a lot of healing in this society if we were more uh, conscious of the music we're distributing for young people to listen to. Sure. I say that because, for example, in Puerto Rico, a musician had a, a rap, trap, Latin reggaeton artist, Bad Bunny. Bad Bunny, yeah. He's like, household word. Sure. Um, I'm from another generation. I have to learn to appreciate his music. Mm. <laughs> I listen to the lyrics and the way he delivers it. And I said, okay, I got to listen to this again to really get into this. Sure. Mm. But I did learn something 13, 14 years ago. I taught at Brooklyn College in the Puerto Rican and Latino Studies Department. Yeah. Uh, introduction to Puerto Rican culture. I was hired to teach that and teach um, uh, African religions in Spanish-speaking societies of the Caribbean. Okay. Okay. I was hired for that, but now they liked me. They, could you teach the introduction to Puerto Rican? Yes. So I started... And there's the, you know, bomba plena, here out on music, and da, 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 and the, the students, their eyes were glazing over. <laughs> Who was popular in the culture in 2008? Daddy Yankee. Uh -huh. In reggaeton, the Spanish-speaking stations went from ballad format almost overnight yeah. to a reggaeton format. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was shocked. And I didn't want to feel dated. Sure. So let me start. Daddy Yankee. Who is that? Daddy Yankee. We sing Yandel. Tego Calderon, who was actually in, actually a pioneer on certain levels. Yeah. Don Omar, E.B. Queen. I dove into the crossing the generational barrier. Okay, yeah. Who are these artists? So I came back with a couple of homework assignments to study them. Yeah. That YouTube clip, Reggaeton Latino by Don Omar, with all those visuals of Latin American history. Yeah. That's your homework assignment. It's three minutes. Analyze the content. Report back to me. Sure. That class was lit up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> People wanted to contribute. I said, aha. I crossed the generation barrier. Yeah, yeah. So what am I trying to see? I'm trying to understand where young people are at yeah. with the music and what's coded in the music. I'm trying to find a value with Bad, Bad Bunny right now because, yeah. I mean, he filled up stadiums in PR. Yeah. He got around the COVID restrictions and the $300 uh, a pop tickets. Yeah, yeah. People downloaded... Huh? Yeah. How do you do that? And is the, is the content uplifting to young people? Because all music is coded. Sure. So I'm not putting him down. I just, music, we all need to be more responsible of what we listen to. And what Titi would say, I'm going to take uh, uh, advantage of, you know, I think Titi would say, let's be conscious of what our young people are listening to. Is it educating them to uplift themselves? Or is it making them extra angry? They don't need extra anger. You and I know some of this music out there ramps up young people's anger and violent predisposition. We don't want that. We want the music to be uplifting, educational. Not educational in a stuffy way. Yeah. Move, dance to it, but it's got like... So a little message in there. Yeah. You know, shake your shake your shake your booty, man. Salsa. Move, move, move your hips. But 
there's a little quality content. Yeah. It's edifying women. It's identifying a human idiosyncrasy. We could all laugh at a little bit. Yeah. But not put down. Music is coded. Let's use it to our advantage. Yeah. Sure. Now, food. Food is also coded. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Man, um, I learned right away in Puerto Rico. The summer of 1966, when I stayed there for two months, my granduncle, Doña Vicenta, Godro, Doña Vicenta Cruz, Antonetti, Godro, Don Godro is my granduncle. Sure, sure. And with a little twinkle in his eye, he said, don't worry, I'm going to make a mofongo. Eh, I make the best mofongo. I'm going to walk to Bayamon yeah. along the military route too. And back in those days, they would sell, sell the whole uh, pork skin, chicharron, sure. the little wagons. I used to see him all the time. He said, oh, yo, I, I know this guy. I get the best chicharron. <laughs> He come back with a slab of chicharron. <laughs> wow, because I love chicharron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fried pork skin, forget kosher halal, man. <laughs> right? And there's Don Godro, Papi, called Papi, machacando, crushing in the, uh -huh. the mortar, the, the, the garlic. Sure. Da, 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 da. I ate that mofongo, it's like heaven on earth. I'm sure. But then you do a little study. Who invented mofongo? African-descended women mm -hmm. in Puerto Rico who had to cook for the, the plantation owners. Yeah. And they were highly creative. Yeah. And mofongo is a Congo, Central African word. So you had Central African spirituality and aesthetics in food preparation. And that becomes the national dish of Puerto Rico. And then chopped in a mortar. And then, of course, you start to reflect all the history that food represents. The tubers, yame, uh -huh. yuca, cassava. I alluded to in the other conversation how uh, cassava bread, pan de yuca, the, form, the, the recipe's 5,000 years old from yeah. our indigenous relatives. Yeah. So if we're conscious, <clears throat> besides having good appetites, food, there's history in the food. Yeah. There's history in the food. We saw that when we went to India, Kerala, all those spices. Yeah. And you saw, oh, King Solomon came here from this part of the world thousands of years ago just for the spices. Yeah. And the first synagogue and the first uh, mosque were in this, in Kochi. Why? Because this was the spice trade. Uh -huh. And people loved the spices. They traveled thousands of miles to spice up their food, not just for the flavor, but the healing properties, the spiritual properties. And my wife and I look at each other like, mm-hmm. Yeah. So what was Columbus coming here for? To find the faster route for the spice trade? <laughs> and Europe, they said they did, people didn't bathe. They would uh, use um, colognes and perfumes and <laughs> bathe in the water. And they didn't use petrochemicals to create those uh, aromatic, alcoholic potions. Those were herbs and spices uh -huh. that they would dis uh, let sit in high-proof alcohol. Yeah. Because they knew of the spiritual and the healing properties of those herbs, the seeds, the roots, the barks. Wow, so all that in food? Yeah. Yes, it's, that's coded. Absolutely. <clears throat> so if a person's just eating fast food, McDonald's, Burger King, da 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 what's going on there? Yeah. They're separated from the roots of their culture. Now, some cultures had to adopt certain dietary habits for survival. If an enslaved population would always only dished out the entrails of pigs, yeah. they made the best of it. Uh -huh. It's not the healthiest, but it 
provided some continuity. Now, okay, I have compassion for that, but if we dig deeper, every culture has roots connected to the land, and people spend a lot of time and creativity and spiritual connectedness to cultivating food. Yeah, yeah. We see that, and I like to uh, plug into this more, El Dia de los Muertos. Sure. The Day of the Dead that the Mexican families celebrate, and food is a big part of that. It is, absolutely. And they connect to the culture, and that's why, in my opinion, they are accelerating quite well in this country, circumventing some of the uh, assimilation horrors we all know about. Yeah. They haven't let their culture die. Yeah. See? So food. Um, Besides the the little snicker, yeah, good appetite. Yeah, but let's face it, man. You break bread with respect at a meal with family, that's very special. And a lot of us lost that. Yeah. That's why I'm segueing into Titi's Thanksgiving dinners. Sure. Now... Titi was very cognizant of the atrocities against our indigenous family here and the dynamics of Thanksgiving. Oh, she was quite familiar with that. Right? We dig into the histories like, okay, I'm not celebrating that. Mm. However, the opportunity to plug into the collective consciousness of the country, to bring the family together, and have this dinner and break bread and family continuity, man, she was, she was uh, the matriarch and a master of that. When she passed on, that dissipated. Poof, gone. And to re- reestablish that has been, it's very difficult. After how many years? 37 years. Yeah. So that Thanksgiving dinner, I still remember with love. And, um, my wife and I don't celebrate Thanksgiving. We celebrate Indigenous Consciousness Day. Sure. And we'll make a vegetarian meal honoring our indigenous relatives here. I don't believe that millions of turkeys should be slaughtered with barely people saying, thank you. Yeah. I don't believe in that. You know, if you eat a turkey, it should be slaughtered with honor consume it with with, uh, respect and so forth. But for, you know, the slaughtering houses in the millions, maybe billions, that people barely say thank you, pass the gravy, where's the cranberry sauce? Uh Where's the consciousness? No, no. Let's get back to consciousness. Yeah. Thanksgiving, quite frankly, should be every day. I give thanks every day over my meal. My wife and I say a two-minute prayer, thanking the Almighty, thanking Mother Earth, because I'm going to segue into closing here. Mother Earth, man, and I'm writing about this. We look up for God as Father. What about God as Mother? Mm -hmm. You know, I was raised a Roman Catholic, Holy Mary, Mother of God. Santa Maria, Madre de Dios. Mother, Madre de Dios. Yeah. How come Mother of God never gets any, any conversation? Yeah. She gave birth to God. Metaphorical, anthropomorphic, whatever it is, the Mother of God. And why are we looking up in the sky for God when God is supposed to be within? We're yeah. expressions of the Almighty and Mother Earth. Mother Earth. I mean, huh? She provides, she's a living being. Just like we have microorganisms crawling on our skin and thousands of cells that have their own assignments. We don't tell our blood cells and liver cells and kidney cells and we don't tell them what to do. They have their own assignments. We as human beings like little, little cells on Mother Earth's skin. She's alive. I think she's kind of like pissed off at the human race right now. Yeah. You're thinking about nuclear war in Ukraine and Russia? No, give me a break. No, Mm -hmm. no, no. I don't like this. 
Why are you polluting my oceans? Yeah. Uh, don't you guys get it? Why are you polluting the air? Why are you dumbing down young people? You know, I'm getting tired of this. <laughs> Remember the flood? Remember? And you're calling on extraterrestrials? <laughs> They're looking at you like, ah, oh, they're not ready yet. <laughs> they got to upgrade their consciousness for them to join the Cosmic Federation. Yeah, they're like, we're not touching that with a tinfoil. No, nah, <laughs> free will. They got to grow through crap to join our Galactic Federation. Yeah. But we don't want them to blow up that beautiful planet. So we'll intervene if these guys muck up so bad that some nut job is going to push that button. Yeah. We'll intervene. But in the meantime... Keep praying, because you're going to need it. Yeah, Mother Earth, our Mother Earth, our indigenous relatives, our indigenous Taino, our Kalinago, our African indigenous elders, we honor Mother Earth, man. So that means we have to honor the food. How come we got to give thanks for the agrarian workers who are picking the tomatoes and picking the fruit why are they demonize as, as less than human and they're treated like crap, man? Yeah. We just had a nice lunch. Who gives thanks? We do. But most people don't. So food, music, Mother Earth, culture. See, Titi would say this is all related. If we're going to upgrade our society... And live by the values of Don Eugenio Maria de Hostos. Hay que educar el pueblo. We have to educate the community. Mm -hmm. And every child is born with hope. And education is not just book learning. Yeah. It's let's learn from other cultures. Let's learn from talking to each other. And we can find the bridge between science and spirituality too. You know? Look, Albert Einstein was very spiritual. Yeah. He would get some of his uh, inspiration. Just, I say a prayer to God, I sit under the tree, take a nap, and all the formulas pop up. What I do? I say a prayer. God, would you help me out? <laughs> I try to, I got the message. I got to figure, put it in mathematical language. Uh, take a nap? Okay, I'll take a nap. <laughs> Tesla. <laughs> Tesla. Tesla is very spiritual. Mm. He got his inspiration from lightning bolts. Yeah. If lightning bolts, can we harness that energy? That's got to be everywhere. Maybe we could run cars with no combustible fuel. Yeah. We could be advanced. The Kardashev scale. Five types of civilizations. Kardashev, a, a, a Russian physicist that uh, Michio Kaku quotes. Five types of civilizations we're not type one yet mm. we're 0 0.65 or something yeah a type one civilization harnesses the energy of their home planet without pollution uh -huh. without excavation without destroying the ecosystem sure a type two civilization harnesses the energy of their solar system that means they have an ongoing interactive relationship with all the planets Revolving around their sun. Mm. That's type two. Wow. Type three, as I understand it, I'm just I'm still a student of this, is a society that has a relationship with their galaxy. And mm. they can move from star system to star system interdimensionally. Wow. Oh my goodness. Can we get to type one? Mm. Without polluting Mother Earth? without excavating for more fossil fuels. The energy you and I are employing right now to just move our bodies in intellectual and creative conversation, that's, that's energy. Yeah. We're not type one yet. So there's a lot of coding we could derive from music, from food, from culture, all coming from Mother Earth to help us create a new type of human society. Yeah. That's what Titi would say. And that's, I resonate with that, man. I resonate with that. Yeah. We need to do it. We study history so we don't 
repeat some of the mistakes, we edify what worked. There's a lot of good history. At the same time, there's a lot of creative opportunities we have in front of us, man. Okay? I don't want us to go, I don't want us to become extinct. And, uh, wow. The United States, we have so much potential. Okay? But I really feel, too, you know, um, I don't want to see any more wars where vets come back here after killing people. And the society doesn't do anything for them. Yeah. They're morally and spiritually damaged like my father was. We don't need that, man. Yeah, that's for sure. No. We don't need more weapons. The, 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 the gun manufacturers and all the industries that produce the ammunition, the gunpowder, the bullets, the da 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 Come on, please. No. <laughs> How many more mass shootings do we do we have to witness? Yeah. So at some point we gotta draw the line. So as human beings, we don't want we don't we don't want to do that anymore. We want to create a society that's sustainable, in harmony with Mother Earth's blessings, and we don't have to com- uh, uh, superpowers should not have to compete with each other. Yeah. Hey. Okay? For sure. That's the same. I'm on my soapbox. How are we doing with time? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, it's 2.24. Okay, I'm cool. Uh, we're still recording, right? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, I, I like this, man. I like this. And my wife says, I, you like to talk. I'm sure he'll love that you like to talk. <laughs> Absolutely. I got something to say, honey. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure for today. I'm going to turn the recording off now. Okay, my pleasure, Steve. My pleasure. It's my-